You know what Einstein said about World War III? He said he didn't know how they were going to fight World War III, but he knew how they would fight World War IV with sticks and stones. The Day After is a made-for-TV movie that aired on the ABC television network on Sunday, November 20th, 1983. It follows the stories of several characters in the Midwestern United States before, during, and after a full-scale nuclear war. Dr. Russell Oakes, played by Jason Robards, works at a hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, alongside nurse Nancy Bauer, played by Joe Beth Williams, and Dr. Sam Hychia, played by Calvin Young. Oak spends time with his wife Helen, played by George Ann Johnson, as well as his younger son Alan and his older daughter Marilyn, played by Kyle Aletter. In Harrisonville, Missouri, 40 miles southeast of Kansas City, farmer Jim Dahlberg, played by John Cullum, and his wife Eve, played by B.B. Besch, prepare for this week's upcoming wedding of their eldest daughter, Denise, played by Lori Lathan. Denise is getting married to Bruce Gallatin, played by Jeff East, who is a senior at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas. He attends the school alongside medical student Stephen Klein, played by Steve Gutenberg, and Professor Joe Huxley, played by John Lithgow. Airman First Class Billy McCoy, played by William Allen Young, works at a Minuteman missile launch site in Sweet Sage, Missouri, 20 miles east of Kansas City. Next door to the silos, a family named the Hendrys, played by Antony Becker and Clayton Day, live on a farm with their two young children. As these characters go about their lives in Kansas and Missouri, Cold War tensions run high between the NATO alliance in Western Europe and the communist Warsaw Pact regions of Eastern Europe. It begins on a Friday with a Soviet military buildup along the East German border. This eventually leads to an East German blockade of West Berlin. I have been listening to that thing all day. The blockade of West Berlin continues. The action follows reports earlier this evening of widespread rebellion among several divisions of the East German army. To repeat, East Germany tonight sealed off the borders to West Berlin closing the four principal West German access corridors at Lauenburg, Helmstedt, Erlischhausen, and Rudolfstein. I don't believe this is happening. The United States places all worldwide military forces on high alert and issues an ultimatum calling for the Soviets to end the blockade of West Berlin or it would be considered an act of war. Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you remember Kennedy on television? Telling Khrushchev to turn his boats around. Full retaliatory response. He didn't bat an eye. Didn't happen. It's not going to happen now. Nah, people are crazy, but not that crazy. The next day on Saturday, news reports reveal that NATO forces have attempted to break through the Soviet blockade and heavy fighting has erupted. Soviet MiGs begin striking civilian and military targets in West Germany. Two Soviet-built MiG-25s invaded West German airspace, firing several air-to-ground missiles at a NATO munitions storage facility and also hitting a school and hospital outside of Würzburg. Dr. Oakes, working in Lawrence to teach a class, tries phoning his wife and hears disturbing reports over the radio that evacuations have begun in Russia. is being evacuated. It is not generally known in Washington at the present time whether the evacuation order indicates the entire population of Moscow or whether other major Soviet cities have been similarly affected by an evacuation order. Stephen decides to hitchhike home to Joplin, Missouri, while Bruce gets a haircut and tries to focus on his impending wedding. Who knows? The president's speaking on television at 6 tonight. Maybe he'll old. tell us something new. They'll tell us what they want us to hear. Keep the panic at the low sweat stage. I really don't think either side wants to be the first to use a nuclear device. You know, it's not a question of who, but where. Over whose real estate. Say we explode a nuclear bomb over their troops, 
on our side. The fallout had better not drift over to their side. The thing that bothers me is that damn launch on warning. What's that? That's when one side tells the other that they're going to fire their missiles as soon as they think the other guy's missiles are already on the way. You know, use them or lose them. <laughs> what do you really think the chances of something like that happening way the hell out here in the middle of nowhere? Nowhere? <laughs> There's no nowhere anymore. You're sitting next to the Whiteman Air Force Base right now. That's about 150 Minuteman missile silos spread halfway down the state of Missouri. That's an awful lot of bullseyes. As all of this is happening, the Soviet Union invades West Germany. Having already captured NATO advanced positions along the West German border, the looming question is, how far will Warsaw Pact forces go? Will the Russians advance straight for the Rhine and defy NATO's declared policy of defense by all means, including the use of tactical nuclear weapons? With full naval warfare erupting in the Persian Gulf, News reports circulate that tactical nuclear weapons have been detonated near Frankfurt and Wiesbaden in West Germany. There are still no eyewitness accounts to substantiate the rumor that low kiloton range nuclear weapons were detonated this morning during the conflict, resulting in the reported destruction of Wiesbaden and the outskirts of Frankfurt. This is the emergency broadcast system. All persons in transit in the Kansas City metropolitan area are advised to proceed immediately to the municipal shelter facility in the community or township closest to your current location. While there is no immediate danger to the Kansas City area, the Federal Emergency Management Agency urges that the steps to be taken in the event of a probable attack. The Dahlbergs prepare their farm for a possible war, with Jim stocking his basement with supplies. His wife, Eve, seems to be in denial of the whole situation. Don't you know there's pretty much a national emergency going on? Well, it's just going to have to go on without me, because your daughter is getting married tomorrow, and i got 67 miles to feed. I hope so. But first, got to get some things into the cellar. Oh, I think there's a tornado coming. In the meantime, the Hendry family, living directly next door to a silo, seems oblivious to the international crisis. Those clouds are hurry them open up. Use one more good rain for the cut. Hey, did you kids hear me? Shh. Don't wait a few minutes. Oh, honey, the biscuits. Mm. That three nuclear weapons uh, in the low kiloton range were airburst this morning over advancing Soviet troops. Not wanting the Soviet forces to invade France and have the rest of Western Europe fall, NATO detonates three low kiloton nuclear weapons over advancing Soviet troops. The Soviets retaliate by using a tactical nuclear weapon in Brussels, destroying the regional NATO military headquarters. The State Department says the President is presently in direct communication with Soviet Premier... <laughs> Nuclear bomb of undetermined strength has exploded at regional NATO military headquarters. Soon after, the order comes in from the President of the United States to launch a full-scale nuclear strike against the Soviet Union. As the missiles launch, many head to fallout shelters, as they know the Soviet missiles can't be far behind. What's going on? Those 
of Miniman missiles. Like a test, sort of. Like a warning? They're on their way to Russia. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? Airman McCoy gets whatever information he can before deciding to attempt to head to Whiteman Air Force Base near Sedalia, Missouri to pick up his wife and infant child. Can you believe it? They really got it done. They shacked them. They pushed all the buttons. You know what that means, don't you? Either we fired first and they're going to try to hit what's left, or they fired first and we just got our missiles out of the ground in time. Either way, we're going to get hit. So what are we still standing around here for? Where do you want to go? Well, how about out of here for starters? I got to get my wife and my kid. Oh, we're still on alert, Billy. No one leaves this facility. Oh, come Not on, until man. The who are you kidding? Are you kidding me, man? The bombs will be here before the late. choppers will. Listen. Damn. Listen to me, man. The war is over. It's over. We've done our job. Oak's daughter, Marilyn, takes shelter in the sub-basement of a downtown Kansas City building. while Dr. Oakes finds himself on the freeway between Lawrence and Kansas City. A high-altitude nuclear airburst occurs far up in the atmosphere above parts of the central United States, generating an electromagnetic pulse. This disables vehicles, power, and all electronics. The nuclear war then commences as Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles strike their targets. The nuclear bombs hit missile silos, military bases, and major cities, including a detonation directly over downtown Kansas City. Marilyn, Bruce, the Hendrys, and millions upon millions of people are killed instantly. Following the attack, Dr. Oakes finds himself walking into Lawrence and taking charge at the campus hospital to try and treat the wounded. What did you see? No you were coming from Kansas City. What did you see? I was on the freeway. About 30 miles away. I'm not sure. It was high in the air. Directly above downtown. Like the sun exploded. Airman McCoy, technically a deserter, wanders the roads to try and get to Whiteman Air Force Base until he discovers that that too has been destroyed. I, I said, how Sedalia? There ain't no Sedalia. No Green Ridge, no Windsor, no nothing. Stephen Klein takes refuge with the Dahlberg family after begging for protection in their basement and even offering to bring in his own canned food. Do you know Bruce Gallatin? He's a senior. No. But, but you're from Lawrence, so maybe Bruce is all right. I don't know what happened to Lawrence. I was close to Harrisonville when it started. Must have been five or six of them to the north. And a whole string of them to the south. They must have hit every missile silo from Sedalia to El Dorado Springs. 
Dr. Oakes receives radiation fallout reports over the shortwave radio from Dr. Joe Huxley, broadcasting from the science building on the other side of the campus. We're holding fast at just a hair under uh, 50 rads per hour. I thought that it would have diminished by now. I guess that means we're picking up a lot of fallout from Titan missile bases. Wichita, when will it be safe to move people to other buildings? It'll never be safe. Come on, Joe. Well, it gets down to under two rads an hour. If and when. Have you picked up anybody else on your on your end? Not so. This is Lawrence. This is Lawrence, Kansas. Is anybody there? Anybody at all? In the days following the attack, an address comes across the radio from the President of the United States. In a voice obviously emulating Ronald Reagan, he announces that a ceasefire exists between the United States and the Soviet Union, which has sustained equally catastrophic damage. We are counting on you, on your strength, your patience, your will, and your courage to help rebuild this great nation of ours. God bless you all. That's it? That's all he's going to say? Hey, maybe we're going to be okay. What do you want to hear? I want to know who started it, who fired first, who preempted. You're never going to know that. What difference does it make? He doesn't know how badly we were... He hit. sure would have told us that they would have fired bad. first. As many of the characters slowly die from the effects of radioactive fallout, they wonder the state of their loved ones, the state of the planet, and how long they have left. I wonder who was spared. I wonder if New York, Paris, Moscow, are just like Kansas City now. The day after was the idea of ABC Motion Picture Division President Brandon Stoddard, who after watching the 1979 film The China Syndrome, was so impressed that he envisioned creating a film exploring the effects of nuclear war on the United States. In 1981, Stoddard commissioned the veteran television writer Edward Hume to write the script. Edward Hume undertook a massive amount of research on nuclear war and went through several drafts until ABC finally deemed the plot and the characters acceptable. Three directors turned down the chance to helm the film before Nicholas Meyer accepted. In an interview, director Nicholas Meyer acknowledges that he did have a political agenda for the movie. He said his private grandiose notion was that this movie would help unseat President Ronald Reagan when he ran for re-election in 1984. The original title of the movie was not the day after. The original title selected by Edward Hume was Silence in Heaven. This title took its quote from the book of Revelations, which states, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Writer Edward Hume liked this title not just because of the quote from the book of Revelations, but also because of the fact that it would take an ICBM about half an hour to launch and strike its target. Hume and the director Nicholas Meyer preferred the title Silence in Heaven, but ABC didn't like it at all. The idea for the title The Day After came from Stu Samuels, who was ABC's executive vice president of TV movies and miniseries. He wanted it to convey that this was the story of the fallout, not the nuclear war itself. The screenwriters chose to set the film mostly in Lawrence, Kansas, to dramatize how nuclear war would affect everyone. During the Cold War, it was theorized that Lawrence, Kansas would be one of the few cities completely unaffected by nuclear war because it was near the exact geographic center of the continental United States. That, of course, was false, as many missile silos and military bases are found all throughout that region of the United States. With the full support and encouragement of the city of Lawrence, Kansas, the filmmakers from ABC successfully transformed Lawrence into a nuclear wasteland for a few weeks. 
Over 2,000 Lawrence residents, including many University of Kansas students, were used as extras and were paid $50 to shave their heads bald and act as if they were dying of radiation sickness. They were also asked not to bathe during the aftermath scenes to add authenticity to the movie. Many who worked on the film also had nightmares, which they called nuke-mares. Many of the cast members of this film would find major success throughout the 1980s and 1990s. John Cullum would become well-known for his role on the CBS comedy drama series Northern Exposure in the 1990s. John Lithgow would star on the hit 1990s NBC sitcom Third Rock from the Sun, as well as many, many films. Amy Madigan, Stephen First, Joe Beth Williams, and Steve Gutenberg would all go on to star in many films. Kyle a Letter, who plays the daughter of Jason Robard's character, was the real-life daughter of actress Lee Merriweather, and she would find success for years working alongside Bob Barker on The Price is Right. Oh, she's so hot. It's a shame that in this movie she gets vaporized. The nuclear war takes place in the month of September, on a Saturday afternoon, September 16th. The U.S. Department of Defense would only cooperate with the film's production on the condition that it be made clear in the story that the Soviet Union launched their missiles first. It is deliberately left unclear which side fires the full-scale nuclear attack first. The producers were able to get stock footage of Minuteman 3 ICBM test launches. However, the Department of Defense would not allow them to use stock footage of mushroom clouds. Special effects visual artist Robert Bullock created the nuclear mushroom clouds after he saw a woman pouring milk into her iced tea. After the cream created an upside-down mushroom cloud, he decided to shoot pistons of cream being dumped into large tanks and filmed it upside down. It adds a new, never-before-seen mushroom cloud effect that I believe was far more impactful on viewers than had they just used stock footage from the 1950s of nuclear bombs. However, some stock footage is used for some of the destruction scenes during the attack. President Ronald Reagan watched the film at Camp David more than a month before its airing, on Columbus Day, October 10, 1983. Reagan wrote in his journal, It's very effective and left me greatly depressed. So far they haven't sold any of the 25 spot ads scheduled, and I can see why. My own reaction was one of having to do all we can to have a deterrent and to see that there is never a nuclear war. One long-standing rumor was that the movie was one of the driving forces behind the U.S. and the Soviet Union signing a major nuclear arms reduction treaty in 1987. There was a story that Ronald Reagan sent the director Nicholas Meyer a note saying, don't think your movie didn't have anything to do with this, because it did. However, Meyer said he never received any note, but he did say that President Reagan reached out to praise the film after seeing it. When originally televised, the presidential speech on the radio was delivered by a voice actor who sounded very much like Ronald Reagan. The speech was dubbed by a new voice actor for the VHS, DVD, and cable television versions of the film. Many of you listening to me today have suffered personal injury, sudden separation from loved ones, and the tragic loss of your families. Many of you listening to me today have suffered personal injury, sudden separation from loved ones, and the tragic loss of your families. ABC originally wanted to air the film over two nights, but director Nicholas Meyer thought that was a bad idea. He told the ABC executives, cut an hour out of the movie and hit everyone between the eyes on a single night. The ABC executives agreed, and it was a smart move. The premiere of this television movie was a major, major media event. Sunday, November 20th, a motion picture that takes you beyond imagining. ABC advertised it for months ahead of time. The day after, parental discretion advised. Lawrence, Kansas. Anybody there? Anybody at all? Pamphlets were sent in the mail. Schools assigned students to watch the film. 
The effects of the day after on News Center 5 tonight. A psychologist talks about the day after tonight at 10. On 24 News Tonight, some local reaction to the movie The Day After. That's News Talk Radio. On the day after, the day after. ABC set up special 1-800 hotlines to calm people down during and after the original airing. Actor John Collum warned the audience ahead of time that the film contained disturbing scenes. No sponsors bought commercial time after the nuclear war broke out. The last half of the movie aired completely without commercials. The program aired on ABC at 8 p.m. on Sunday, November 20th, 1983. Estimates put the viewership at over 100 million Americans, with a Nielsen share of 62%. This made the day after, far and away, the most watched movie telecast of all time. The other major networks just couldn't compete. NBC came in a very distant second place, airing the first of a three-part miniseries called Kennedy, starring Martin Sheen as John F. Kennedy. Immediately following the day after's original broadcast, a special edition of ABC's Viewpoint aired, featuring a live audience and a discussion about the movie and the nuclear issue. Moderated by Ted Koppel, the panel consisted of scientist Carl Sagan, conservative writer and commentator William F. Buckley Jr., former Secretary of Defense under John F. Kennedy, Robert McNamara, former Secretary of State under Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, writer, professor, and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, and General Brent Scowcroft. You think that there is a deliberate political effort behind this film? Well, it's certainly deliberate on the part of the writer. He says that was his motives. Now, if you say, was it deliberate on the part of the shareholders of ABC, I I don't think they were consulted. But... um, One notable moment of the discussion came between Dr. Carl Sagan, who opposed the use of nuclear weapons, and conservative writer William F. Buckley, who supported the concept of nuclear deterrence. Biologists who have been uh, studying this think that there is a real possibility of the extinction of the human species from such a war. Let me stop you on that point, because uh, if our viewers were not depressed enough after seeing the movie, I suspect you've brought them to an even greater nadir. Uh, but that, I think that's good news, uh, Mr. Koppel. What is that? What he just said is very good news. Because? If the Soviet Union knows that a first strike is going to mean <coughs> the extinction of the Soviet Union, then there won't be a first strike. I agree with that. I'm amazed yeah. to find myself agreeing with Mr. Buckley, but that's, uh, <coughs> that is absolutely right. The audience was quite educated, with questions seeming to come from both sides of the political aisle. Questions from liberals about a nuclear freeze and questions from conservatives about whether or not America should trust the communists. How can you talk about a nuclear freeze when we're dealing with people who would kill civilians on on an airliner, who would use chemical weapons against women and children along with soldiers, and people who have never held up to many treaties that we made with them? How can we trust the Soviet Union when we're talking about arms control and a nuclear freeze? Without uh, debating whether what you said is factually right or not, which could be interesting, but maybe too time-consuming. Let me merely quote Averill Harriman. This broadcast can actually be found on the Internet. I recommend it for anyone interested in 1980s Cold War history and politics. I heard about this movie growing up as a history geek in the 1990s, but I had never seen it. And I saw the VHS of this film in July of 2003. And I thought, hey, I've never seen this. I was just about 15 years old when I first saw this movie, but even I, in 2003, had a couple of nuclear nightmares following my viewing of this movie. I actually had dreams where we had nuclear attacks, and the mushroom clouds were the same as I saw in this film. But it definitely holds up as a very well-made Cold War era film. I'll give a solid 8 out of 10 stars to the most watched television film of all time, The Day After.